Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Amy Grills, and she will speak on anxiety and reading in the classroom. Dr. Amy Grills is a tenured professor at Boston University and the Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs and Research at Wheelock College of Education and Human Development. She earned her AB from Smith College in 1998 and went on to receive her MA and PhD in clinical psychology from Virginia Tech. Dr. Grills is a licensed clinical psychologist whose research focuses on anxiety, trauma, and depression with a particular emphasis on youth populations. She also has expertise in the development, delivery, and evaluation of cognitive behavioral assessments and interventions. She has published extensively on these topics and received over $4 million in funding to support her research through agencies such as NIH and NSF. Uh, Dr. Grills has been recognized by national organizations for her contributions to her field, with two recent examples, including her selection as a fellow of the American Psychological Association in the Society of Cl Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology, and her appointment to the Board of Directors for the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies. Thank you so much, Dr. Grills, for speaking with us, and um, you're going to love this talk, too. Hello. I'm going to keep my water up here because I'm a bit under the weather, but hopefully no coughing fits today. Can you all hear me okay in the back? Great. All right. So I'm going to be talking today about anxiety and reading in the classroom. I'm going to start with a very quick review about anxiety because you've heard a lot about this already. And then I'm going to focus more specifically on some of the work that our team's been doing over the last 10, 15 years looking at anxiety and achievement in academic domains. Then I'm going to shift gears really quickly and take the laptop down away from my face and shift gears to do that, and then uh, talk a little bit about evidence-based treatments for anxiety disorders and anxiety just more generally, and some of the difficulties that we've had in integrating those into schools in particular. And then I'm going to share with you the approach that our team has taken to try to overcome those difficulties and share with you some of our preliminary outcomes from a study that we are in the middle of completing right now. So I wanted to start by just thanking Will Baker um, and Joan Mealy McCarthy, the Dyslexia Foundation, for having me. This is work that I am really passionate about, and I'm so excited to be sharing it in a room full of people who I know also really care about this. Um, I want to thank our team at UT Austin and Boston University who have been working with us over these years, the students who have been in our studies, and in particular the teachers who have been implementing our work. And then also NIH, so much of our work has been supported by NICHD in particular, and so we wouldn't be able to be conducting all of this without their support. So I wanted to start with a few clinical stories. So um, as you heard, I'm a clinical child psychologist, so much of my career has been spent um, learning about anxiety disorders in kids and treating them in specialty clinics. And so over the years, there were a number of different cases that I saw, and I kind of blended them together into these stories to keep them anonymous. But these were the sorts of things I found myself encountering over and over again. So Abram, age 10, had not gone to school for the better part of a year, and that year was spanning two grades at the time when I saw him. Um, he had fears about being away from his mom primarily, but also getting sick at school. So he had once thrown up at school, and that had led to a pattern of him being more and more fearful. And at the point when I saw him, he was fully um, avoiding school. Charlotte <clears throat> was a little bit younger. She had been diagnosed with a reading disability in first grade. She had been receiving extra services for several years and had been placed in the lowest reading group year after year, in her, year after year in her classroom, which she was very well aware of, right? So students know, despite often people trying to keep it from them, they know when they're struggling to learn, and they certainly know that, that they've been grouped into a group that's, uh, whose reading materials look different than someone else's, perhaps. So she had become really self-conscious about reading in front of others in particular. Um, and then as she was getting older, it was starting to generalize to more social settings. So she was getting more nervous just even interacting with her peers, even in the lunchroom. 
Um, so she had a lot of fears around kind of being teased about her reading struggles. Michelle uh, was a teenager, and she was worrying about so many different things that she found herself completely unable to focus at school. So you heard about some of the different disorders. This would be an adolescent with something more like generalized anxiety disorder. So she was worrying about her own health and her family, um, war and politics, so many things. And she found that it just kept interfering for her. And while she wanted to do well in school and she was motivated and she would try, she was so distracted that she found herself failing and that was a new experience for her. And so she started to feel a lot of stress and anxiety about going to school because she worried that this was going to happen and she was gonna have another failure experience. So I suspect that these are stories that resonate with a lot of people in the room and that you've probably worked with a lot of kids like this as well. I see a lot of heads nodding. Um, and so this is sort of the impetus for the work that I've been doing for the, a number of years now. So around the same time that I started to develop an interest in better understanding anxiety and learning, I was working at um, the University of Houston and had the pleasure of meeting Sharon Vaughn and Jack Fletcher, who were working at the Texas Learning Disabilities Research Center. And they had this comprehensive model that you see here. This is out of Fletcher, um, Lyon, Fuchs, and Barnes's 2007 book on learning disabilities, where they were really proposing all of these different factors that are involved in um, academic skill deficits. And the one I've highlighted in red, of course, is the one we're talking about today. It's this sort of behavioral, emotional piece of things. And that's where I really wanted to focus my energy. And so I teamed up with this group and started developing a line of work. So as you've heard, uh, anxiety in kids. Uh, so this is a mood state characterized by strong negative emotions and bodily symptoms of tension. There's an anticipation of future danger. It's similar in kids as it is in adults, um, but it often takes some, some slightly different forms. So a lot of adults will manage it in uh, different ways than kids. Kids will often cry. Um, kids often will report a lot of the physical signs first and not have the recognition that the physical signs are tied to their fears or their um, anxiety. We have these three interrelated response systems, so the physiological or physical signs, the subjective system, so um, thoughts about being scared, some kids have images of bodily harm happening to them, <laughs> And then the behavioral system, um, often for kids, if you think of the fight or flight, it's the flight response, um, the, where they're wanting to avoid the situation. Some kids cry or become aggressive. In moderate amounts, um, anxiety can be adaptive, but as it increases in intensity, it's when it becomes more and more distressing and problematic. And as you've heard, it's very common. In fact, among the most common disorders of childhood, particularly if you move away from thinking about disorders and just think about anxiety as a, a kind of more of a spectrum of something, kids who have elevated anxiety are extremely common. It's also very commonly overlooked. So a lot of times kids who are experiencing significant anxiety have been experiencing it for a long period of time before it's noticed because they're often quiet. Right? It's, in, it's an internalizing problem, we say. So it's something that's often hidden. Um, you don't always recognize the signs early. Or a lot of times the signs look like ADHD. The child seems inattentive. The child isn't focusing. And so it's suspected that that is the problem when, in fact, it's that the child is really worrying a lot. We see anxiety in all ages. Um, it's often more prevalent in females, and it's highly comorbid with other areas. And there are lots of reasons kids experience anxiety. So we're talking about one specific area today, but there are just lines and lines of research all showing these different developmental pathways that all result in anxiety for kids. <clears throat> So specific to anxiety and academic domains, when I first began this work, there was a small, now growing literature linking anxiety and academics. And what the studies were finding were that very specific kinds of anxiety, like test anxiety, were being linked with poorer achievement for kids. So there were a number of studies that had found that kids who were reporting being more fearful of taking tests were then having worse performance on math, for example. 
There were also some studies that had looked at a very kind of general form of anxiety, and often they were um, based on teacher report. And because we know that sometimes this is an internal symptoms for kids, teacher report can be really strongly related, and other times it's not related at all to kids' own report. So there were some difficulties in kind of discerning the findings with these um, teacher-reported general anxiety scales. Then there were also studies that were looking more broadly just at school-related stress. So not specific to anxiety so much as just stress about the school environment, often around the climate at school or difficulties with peers. And all of these were showing the same thing, both um, at the same time, but also looking over time. There's also been some work done um, by Scrimmon and colleagues looking at student mood and where they've been able to demonstrate that student mood can have an impact on academic task performance. Um, and the idea behind this is uh, the same, right? That this could be during uh, via cognitive interference. So if you are focused on your negative mood or worrisome thoughts, you're diverting resources away from your academic tasks to be focusing on that experience. It's an unpleasant experience, as you've heard, and so it's hard to ignore when you're experiencing that. And finally, there were some uh, initial studies that were finally linking anxiety specifically with dyslexia and reading difficulties in kids and comparing them to their peer group. But we had a lot of lingering questions. So we noticed that a lot of the studies that had been done were with older kids and adolescents, but we wondered if we would see these same connections with kids when the reading problems are first beginning. I see a lot of people nodding their heads because I think they fully recognize the answer already. Uh, we worried about, uh, wondered about specific types of anxiety, so both general and kind of um, state anxiety, like in the moment, more global and trait anxiety, and also reading specific anxiety for kids since we were going to be looking at kids who were struggling with reading. We were also interested in what else might be involved. So going back to this idea of like cognitive interference, we were interested in how attention, for example, might be um, related to these findings. And then we were really um, wanting to try and get a sense of if anxiety was going to differentially affect kids who were receiving a reading intervention. Pause. <clears throat> so we conducted a series of studies um, with kids in grades one through three, so early elementary school where these students were already receiving, um, they had already been identified as struggling readers, and they were randomized to be receiving either a intervention delivered by an intervention teacher or classroom business as usual. Um, and then there was also a subset of kids that were being followed who were identified as meeting benchmarks already, so they were referred to as typical readers. And so for each of these kids, they were in a big study and they were receiving lots of academic and achievement measures. And what we did is we decided to add some of these um, more psychometrically sound, validated, typical clinical anxiety measures that I brought in from the clinical side of things. So we brought in the mask, which you've heard about. Um, we also brought in the Beck Youth Inventory, which allows for evaluation of um, anxiety and depression and self-concept. And then we looked at attention using the strengths, weaknesses of ADHD um, symptoms and normal behavior scale. And what we found <clears throat> is what we suspected, right? So when we looked just broadly across all the students in the study, the students who were identified as struggling and those who weren't, um, we found that anxiety was related to achievement. And we found this bidirectional association that you've heard about. So we found evidence that both kids who began the year and were reporting um, more anxiety over the course of the year had poor performance. And likewise, kids who began the year showing poor performance on these achievement measures over the course of the year were reporting more anxiety. We did not see gender differences, which was quite interesting because they're common at the disorder level, but as we broadened back, we're not seeing it anymore. And we saw some inter interesting interaction patterns. So this idea with attention, for example, we found that when kids were inattentive, 
their performance on fluency measures was just universally low. It didn't really matter how anxious they were. They were performing less well. But for kids who were highly attentive, if they were experiencing anxiety, their levels came down so that they were performing more poorly as well. And so it spoke to this idea that there may be a unique role for anxiety for kids um, in terms of its impact on their performance. We then looked at kids who were identified as either responding to the intervention that they received over the course of that year or not. And we used just benchmarks, standard benchmarks for their achievement measures to kind of roughly classify them in this way. And for these first grade children, we found that separation anxiety levels at the beginning of the year predicted their end of year classification as either a non-responder or a responder. So again, this evidence for both directions for the anxiety. So then we replicated this. <clears throat> so this is now a group of second grade children. Same thing, we have some struggling readers and some kids who are typically achieving. And what you see here is that they're at the beginning of the year reporting pretty similar levels of anxiety and depression. And these other signs, these are from this mask measure. So the mask measures physical signs of anxiety, um, social anxiety symptoms, separation anxiety symptoms, harm avoidance symptoms, and they look pretty similar. But at the end of the year, they no longer look similar. So all kids in the um, typical group have come down slightly on average right, um, in their let reports of anxiety and depression. And we see that pattern actually replicate over and over in our studies, that over the course of an academic year, kids tend to start a bit higher in their reports of anxiety and come down slightly over the course of the year, perhaps as they just get settled and adjusted to the school year. So what you see here, though, that's important is that the kids who responded to their reading intervention follow that same pattern and, in fact, come down even a bit further and look quite similar to our typically achieving uh, students. But the kids who did not respond to the intervention stayed flat. So their levels of anxiety and depression did not change over time. So then we looked at it a bit differently and we wanted again, it's like the chicken or the egg argument, which comes first, the anxiety or the reading, right? And so we wanted to look again, well, does anxiety, if it's elevated at the beginning of the year, is this influencing uh, children's response to intervention? And sure enough, we found elevated anxiety at the beginning of the year was associated with an increased likelihood of being classified as a non-responder at the year end. So these percentages, this is the percent of kids who um, were classified as a non-responder or responder who began the year with elevated anxiety. So you can see it's a huge difference there. And then we were interested in looking at how anxiety changes over the course of the year, right? So as we would expect, there's a large percent of kids who, who start the year um, reporting just kind of normative levels of anxiety. And there's a range of normative anxiety. It's not zero, it's not flatlined, but there's a range. So they began the year low and they stay low throughout the course of the year. And then there's a subset of kids who start high and stay high. And these are kids who probably need individual or group intervention. Um, they need something more specifically tailored. And it's probably, um, these are kids who are probably already reached the point of having a clinical diagnosis. What you see here are kids who changed in terms of the reports throughout the year. So we have this pattern I mentioned where a lot of kids start high and come down a bit. So they begin the year reporting elevated levels of anxiety, but by the end of the year, they've come down below the benchmark for um, subclinical anxiety. And it's pretty consistent across the different groups. But what's not consistent is the number of kids who begin the year reporting low levels of anxiety and increase to the point of reporting subclinical or clinical levels of anxiety. That is disproportionately greater in kids who don't respond to their intervention. So again, we're seeing kind of both sides of this over and over again, where it's really clear that anxiety seems to be something that is um, more persistent in kids when they're not responding to their intervention. It seems to be something um, that is also developing over time potentially for kids as they continue to struggle. <clears throat> 
so some of our take home messages from this initial body of work we did. The studies confirmed our hypotheses and were consistent with the this, this smaller literature that had already been developing, um, showing that anxiety and these related symptoms were linked with academic and achievement variables. Importantly, we saw that these associations were already present early in elementary school. And so this really spoke to us about the need to start assessing for these difficulties early and providing interventions early. So not waiting until it was reaching clinical levels, but trying to start intervening quickly. The differences that we were seeing with the responder, non-responder kids suggested to us that levels of anxiety might make kids more or less responsive to the intervention they're receiving for reading. Um, and that not responding might lead kids to become increasingly anxious over time. So all of this led us to this point where we felt like, okay, it's very clear that these are complex interrelationships. It's very clear that there are some kids who are developing anxiety along the way after they've been struggling. And it's very clear that there are kids who are anxious and it is interfering with their learning. And so the best way we thought to try to address this is to target both. <clears throat> Pause. So this seemed like a really uh, clear solution, but the problem is the solution has challenges. <coughs> so as a clinical psychologist, I am well aware how siloed the different fields of study have been and that this is something that has been um, kind of a challenge for me in trying to get information out about evidence-based treatments that have been developed in the clinics and how you can adapt them outside of clinical practice to be able to reach more kids. So as you heard, we know that there are about 20 to 35% of kids are in need of some form of intervention and less than a third of them actually get any form of treatment. So those numbers are just staggering. There's so few kids getting the help that they need. And one of the ways that we've attempted to um, change that is to call on schools. Right, so you all are well aware. Schools have been increasingly called on to also provide mental health services and to help with some of these problems that we're experiencing in getting treatments out there to more and more kids. There are a ton of benefits to this approach, right? So you can reach more kids in need. That is the biggest benefit of all. Um, you can reach kids earlier. There are huge inequities in getting kids services, right? So there are wait lists that are extraordinarily long. Um, cognitive behavior therapy, which I'm gonna talk about a lot in a minute, is often the frontline treatment for anxiety and is often also a treatment where you will have difficulty finding a provider who takes insurance, who doesn't have an enormous wait list, who actually was trained in the treatment approach doesn't just say they were so that they can recruit more patients. Um, and so all of these difficulties now are bleeding into schools where we're now trying to get schools to be providers as well. So we know there are these evidence-based treatments, but the uptake of them within schools has stayed low, and this is a concern. And there are a number of challenges for why this is happening. I'm gonna highlight a couple around selection and application, <clears throat> but others that I hear about over and over again from um, families, <laughs> district leaders, other professionals, are things like, we've been given this mandate to provide mental health services and we were given no guidance on what that means. So we are, as a school or as a district, trying to figure this out. We are doing our best. We desperately want to help these kids, and we don't know what to do or where to go. Um, others are faced with having decision makers who are picking the programs that go into their schools outside of the profession. So they are sometimes parent groups who are leading the charge. They are sometimes principals or superintendents who actually don't have um, a line of training in this area. And so they're relying on um, marketing, as you heard about, is often an approach that wins out. Um, they're relying on 
something that they've read in a pop psychology magazine recently or that they've heard about from another individual, and that these um, problems are perpetuating this issue of getting evidence-based treatments into the schools. There's also issues with the term evidence-based, and there's issues with so many of the terms I'm going to be using today, but evidence-based is one of them. So there are so many things are evidence-based now. It's amazing. It is a term that gets used uh, to describe pretty much everything, and different leading organizations even have come out with their own criteria, which complicates things, because if you go to one website, you're going to get a different answer than another. So it's all very complicated for folks who are trying to navigate this. So a selection issue. <clears throat> So this is one snippet um, from Kasdan's 2000 book where he laid out that there are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of treatments out there that purport to be effective for treating mental health uh, concerns in kids. On this list here, it's literally just a page, there are a couple that have some evidence behind them, things like bell and pad conditioning. If anybody has worked with kids who have enuresis or bedwetting, bell and pad is an evidence-based treatment for that. But a lot of these are not, including things like D.A.R.E. Right? So D.A.R.E. was a program that came out that had a lot of support. There are still districts using D.A.R.E., but we actually have plenty of studies now that show that D.A.R.E. is not actually effective in the ways it was intended to be. Another issue is the application, and this has become even more complex as we've introduced these broad SEL programs into districts. So SEL, socio-emotional learning programs, are meant to be, they were designed to be universal programs that could be utilized over the course of time with the hope that they would reduce later mental health concerns for kids. They're not meant to be quick fixes, they're not meant to be cure-alls, but a lot of them are very expensive and resource intensive, and people have started to rely on them as if they are a cure-all. So they'll say they address bullying and anxiety and learning, and they address everything, and in fact, there isn't evidence backing that. The evidence is much broader for what they are intending to do. Um, I have Blaze and the Monster Machine on here because I saw it one day on TV and it just reminded me of this because Blaze, this 20 minute cartoon about monster trucks, was going to be teaching my children apparently problem solving as well as all aspects of STEM. Um, other examples of application issues. So it's sort of the translation of skill. So when things are broad and they're not well defined, we get this disconnect for kids. So an example is self-management. Um, this is a core socio-emotional domain. And after um, this, this section had been completed in one school, we asked a couple of kids about it to see what they had learned. So the first child said, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, so they, we, we know the school had been focusing on this, right? So it's not that they were lying and they didn't do it, it's that there was a disconnect. The child didn't understand that that's what this was called or that that's what they were supposed to be kind of taking from what they learned. The second child said, it means like control. Okay, good. So how do you do that, we asked. And she said, I don't know, maybe you go sit in the calm down corner. We said, okay, what's, what's that? And she said, it's the place with toys. And it turned out that in her room, they had identified a corner of the room and filled it with fidget spinners and coloring books and various other toys and activities for kids to go to when they felt like they needed to take a break and calm down and, um, or pause for a bit. And the kids all knew that the corner was there and it was the place with toys, but the problem was they weren't being taught any tools. So they weren't being taught how to calm down while they were in the corner, or what they might do while they were coloring, or how coloring might actually relax them. They were just being told, go to the corner. And this is just a, um, it reminds me of when I was taking like the SATs and you have the this is to this is this is to this, but it is a, apropos, I think, for this group. So I often say, when you're trying to teach kids to read, you're not just gonna drop a pile of books on them and expect them to figure it out. 
And the same thing goes with teaching kids how to cope with anxiety, right? You can't just give them coloring and say, figure out the coping technique. So the unfortunate outcome of these complicated issues has been that most kids who are receiving services in schools are actually not getting something that's been found to be effective. So when you go back to this idea that we've got a sizable number of kids who need treatment, very few of them are getting it, even those kids who are getting treatment are often getting something that does not work. It's perpetuating these access issues and inequalities that we have, right? So in order to recognize that a child who's suffering from anxiety might uh, benefit from cognitive behavior therapy, that person needs to have time, resources, a family, or people in their life who are educated to know that this is a first-line approach. They have to have the ability to get to the provider. And that is just perpetuating these inequalities over and over again for who actually can get the treatments that work. And the last point, which is probably one of the bigger points here to make, is that teachers are also increasingly reporting stress and frustration about all of this. So they desperately want to help their students. That is the one message I hear over and over again. And they are so frustrated that they don't know how. And that they don't think that the programs that they're being told to use are working and no one seems to be listening to them. And sure enough, you know, we know teachers have a few responsibilities. So in their spare time, they're not actually likely to go get licensed as psychologists just to be able to do this too. Um, and they also report a lot of concerns with just their, their incoming knowledge, right? So most teachers did not have coursework in their prep programs on mental health and much less treatment of mental health, but even just base rates and how frequently these things occur and warning signs and how to differentiate and how to work with parents when you have identified something and you want the parents to recognize it too. None of this is present in most programs and there have now been a number of studies that show this as well, right? <clears throat> So our solution is, has been to bridge these two fields. So kind of break through these silos and continue the work that we were doing, um, bringing now back the hat I sometimes wear as a clinical child psychologist who knows how to deliver evidence-based treatment for anxiety, was trained in doing so and ran clinics in individualized settings, right? So these sort of standard CBT clinic settings. And bridging that work, <clears throat> to integrate it into an evidence-based program for reading. So this was a two-step process, um, and I'll talk about both. The first step was to develop a program drawing from these evidence-based programs that treat anxiety in kids that could be used in schools. Right? I wasn't just going to pick up individualized therapy and drop it into the classroom. That's, that's not going to work. So we developed this first, and then we worked to integrate it into the reading intervention program. Some quick important context about child anxiety treatment before I tell you about the treatment. <coughs> so cognitive behavior therapy is the most effective psychological treatment for anxiety and has long been recommended as the first line of treatment. We've got consistent studies um, going back 30, 40 years now, all showing over and over again that roughly two thirds of kids who have anxiety respond to CBT. So when you compare kids who are receiving CBT to wait list, 59% um, who receive CBT respond and show a remission of diagnosis versus 16% of kids who are in a wait list group. When we compare kids who get CBT to kids who get a non-active control, so that would be like a wait list, you see these medium to large effects. When you compare them to kids who get an active control, so like an attention control, they're still getting something, um, you see small to medium effects. <clears throat> and over and over again, so there's a variety of treatments that are out there that are CBT. The most famous one that a lot of people have heard of is called the Coping Cat, developed by Phil Kendall and his team and adapted in a variety of ways. Um, there's also the Friends Program. There's a number of different treatment protocols now that all utilize these same basic principles and have been adapted. 
And what they target are, see if this now feels repetitive, but the physiological signs of anxiety that kids experience, so they target the feelings. They target the distorted information processing and the sense of lack of control, so the thinking part of it. And the escape and avoidance that kids are feeling they need to do when they are anxious. So the, the doing is what we call it. <coughs> so as I said, our first step was to adapt these programs to something that could be better utilized in a school setting, and in particular, in a setting where kids are receiving um, intervention for reading difficulties. <clears throat> so we knew that time and resources were going to be short. We did not want to take away significantly from instruction time, but we wanted to be able to deliver this information. We knew that we wanted to target subclinical distress as well. We didn't want to just be thinking about um, kids who have anxiety disorders. To me, I think about kind of your RTI approach. Kids who have clinical level distress should probably be receiving more intensive intervention. We wanted to try and reach a broader range of kids who are just anxious and stressed. We wanted it to be deliverable by non-clinicians. So that meant um, the program I developed is heavily scripted. Um, and we run professional development with the teachers who are de delivering it multiple times. We don't just give them it all at once. We do follow-up. Um, we do a lot of practice. We do deliberate practice where they are actually um, practicing with one another. And we have people who can do follow-up check-ins check, check and answer questions as needed. And we had to make sure it works. So the first thing we did is we needed to make sure it works after we developed it. And the first uh, version of it was sort of a, a lengthier version. So there's, this was the, the, the starting point. So in the first version, the program I developed um, was about 15, and it ended up being sometimes as many as 30 minutes a day. And we delivered this to kids for five weeks. And these were kids who were already receiving um, a reading intervention, and we separated out half these kids and gave them um, this program, and the other half just kept working only on their reading time. And we just wanted to see if it would work. Could we do this? And after five weeks, we saw that the kids who received the anxiety intervention um, showed significant reductions on both clinical and reading anxiety scales, and that it brought their anxiety levels down within the normative range. So this was really exciting for us. Um, we also saw that they were reporting reduced state anxiety, so they had these weekly reading tests where we'd ask them how anxious they were, and the kids who were getting the anxiety part of this intervention were reporting less and less anxiety each week before their tests. So we saw it could work. We saw we could do this delivery in a brief way, and we saw that the kids really liked it. So the students were reporting um, that they were using the tools that we were teaching them. They were reporting that they were using them outside of the intervention period. They were telling us that they were teaching their friends about it at lunch. They really liked um, this approach, and the teachers also were liking it. So we proceeded, um, and we adapted it down even further. So in the current iteration of it, which I'll talk about, so the program is called Strong Students Toolbox. Um, we reduced it down so that the students are receiving this five to ten minutes each day. So we've tried to make it even less of an um, interference with instruction time. And we worked very hard to more fully integrate this into the reading um, intervention protocol. So it is, I'll show you examples, but it is a program that is meant to be kind of commingling these two areas. And what generally happens in the program, similar to CBT in general, is kids are going to be provided um, what we call psychoeducation, so just education and information about the different pieces that we're going to be teaching them. And there's a lot of normalizing experiences, because kids often think that they are alone. Right? They think they're the only one feeling this. So we spend a lot of time normalizing their experience. Then we teach them a skill, very briefly and in a hyper-applied way. So we have made lots of interactive exercises and techniques to teach kids the different skills. Then they practice it. Then they probably practice it again. Then they practice it in an applied way, like during a reading test or in the middle of their reading lesson. And then we move on. So this pattern sort of repeats with each of the different tools that we introduce. 
we use the toolbox analogy for kids because we talked to them very clearly about the fact that we are going to be teaching them a variety of different tools that they can use when they are feeling stressed or upset and that, that it's helpful for them to think of it as a toolbox because they can go in and try a different tool at different times and the kids like that uh, analogy. So here's our thinking, feeling, doing guys. So we explain to kids about the fact that <clears throat> uh, the, the way you think about things and the way you feel and the things you do are all interrelated. Right? So if I am thinking negative thoughts, I am probably not feeling real good. I might be sad if I'm thinking that people are all laughing at me um, or if I'm thinking everyone in this audience looks so bored. I am probably not feeling real good. Right? I might get a stomach ache, I might feel sad, and that's gonna influence what I do. Maybe I'm going to leave. Um, maybe I'm going to put my head down in the classroom. Right? And that these all have these bi-directional arrows because they can all influence one another. And we talk to kids about how what we're going to be doing is teaching them ways to intervene at each of those errors. So we want them to be able to break any of the arrows because sometimes it's easier to change the way you feel and sometimes it's easier to change the way you're thinking about something. So this is just some of the examples. Um, we try and tie things back to reading for kids a lot. Um, so when we're teaching them the difference between their thoughts and their feelings and their actions, we give them lots of examples because a lot of times we'll ask kids, how are you feeling? And they'll say, I was feeling like I was running out of the room. I'll say, well, okay, that was probably what you were doing. What were you thinking? I was thinking that my stomach hurt. Well, your, the stomach hurt was probably the feeling. You know, we, we try to help them really understand the different pieces. And then we start teaching really specific tools for each of those. So we teach kids <laughs> diaphragmatic breathing, but of course we don't call it diaphragmatic breathing because these are young kids. So we call it bubble breathing and we use um, bubbles because the experience of taking a deep breath and blowing a big bubble through a wand actually mimics diaphragmatic breathing. And so we help kids to get that feeling and teach them that in that very applied way first. And then we gradually remove the bubbles, which they hate because the bubbles are fun, um, and introduce uh, them to uh, just breathing on their own, so a tool they can use all the time. Here you see some quotes from a couple of professional athletes. We also try to introduce them, again, with normalizing this, to the fact that professional athletes, singers, actors, people across the world are using these different tools that we are going to teach them and that it is very common and that people use them because they are effective at helping you feel less stressed. We teach them a couple forms of imagery. So this is imagining the rainbow as a way of self-soothing and calming down. We walk them through uh, targeting thinking. So this is the second bubble. Um, so we teach them about the difference between a positive or a helpful thought and a negative or an unhelpful thought. And we talk a lot about how having negative or unhelpful thoughts influences the way you feel and what you do and ways that you can address it. We teach kids how to challenge their negative thoughts and this is just one of the strategies we use. So we teach them this be a detective, be a friend, or be a scientist. And many kids really like the be a friend. We talk to them about how a lot of times we're much harder on ourselves than we are on others in our lives. And so what would you say to your friend if they told you they were feeling this way? And then we work with them on how to change a negative thought into a more helpful thought. We use a lot of strategies to help kids remember all the tools we're teaching them. So pause is one. We talk to them about like taking a moment and pausing like you might pause on the remote. And we use this um, to say, you know, the P stands for pay attention to my thinking and feeling. The A is asking yourself, am I anxious or stressed? The U is using my relaxing tools. Um, the S is substituting a more helpful thought. And the E is encouraging myself that I can do it. And this is just, this is the first half of the tools. There's 10 in the end, but this is just showing you, again, sort of how we go through them. <coughs> and then we have the integration with the reading. <coughs> So you'll see here, this is kind of a standard lesson for the kids. And so they begin 
This one is focused on um, identifying physical signs of anxiety. So they begin and they spend some time doing this, and this is an interactive activity that they're working on. We have our, our uh, lovely Claude the squirrel. Um, Claude is very anxious. He has every sign of anxiety I could think of. And the kids have these um, different indicators, and they have to go up and put them on Claude. Right? So they, they're getting up. They're doing a practice experience. Here he is, bigger. We talk about Claude and all these different signs. We talk to kids about how different kids have different feelings. Nobody is the same. Some kids shake, some kids turn red, some kids um, might uh, tap their finger. Those are all different things, and it, they're all similar. Then the kids move into their reading instruction, which um, this, this lesson is talking about context clues. And they spend time getting their explicit instruction around that. And then we jump back in later, and we go back to our physical signs. And we say, hey, remember? How are you feeling right now? What's your anxiety level like? And we talk to them again about this. Then they go back into some more reading. And at the end, they have these little wrap-ups. So we try to remind them, this is what we talked about today. What would it feel like for you? So what's one way that you notice when you're feeling stressed? And we have them write them on these cards. Another way we integrate it in is we have um, mixed in with their reading comprehension stories. Stories of kids contrived from the work I've done with kids who struggle with reading and anxiety. So these are typically a mix up of cases that I've seen and they are very specifically written on purpose to both normalize the experience that we know a lot of these students are having, give them somebody else they can identify with and work through for somebody else first what they could do before they do it for themselves. OK. Five minutes, quickly? OK. So now with this new version, we have this five-year study. And you're going to hear more about this this afternoon. <clears throat> so we have finished the first cohort of this study. Um, and that's what we're going to be talking with you about. So the purpose was to really evaluate the efficacy of this new integrated program that we're using. The students that are in our study are starting the study in grades three and four. They are receiving four, uh, two years of intervention. And the first year looks like what I just explained. And in the second year, the anxiety piece even filters out a bit more and becomes five to 10 minutes a week instead of a day. And it's much more focused on review, like a booster session and generalizing. So we ask kids to take the approaches and take it home and teach it to a stuffed animal, a pet, a family member, a friend, whomever. So we're trying to get them to take on kind of a teaching role with it as well. Um, the students in our study are, are identified as struggling readers only. So they're not blocked on anxiety. And they are randomized to either receive um, this combined treatment a treatment where they get reading but math instruction during the same time when kids who are getting the anxiety instruction do. So it's five to 10 minutes of math instead of the anxiety program. Or they get classroom business as usual. Okay. So for this first group, we had about 128 kids who began the study at the end of the year. We had about 94 left. A lot of students moved out of district, so we had a decent amount of attrition. But fortunately, it was pretty similar across groups. Same scales that I was talking about before. So we're looking at sort of clinical anxiety levels, but also subclinical across a variety of domains, as well as reading specific anxiety. OK. You're going to see some of these slides again this afternoon. So I'm rushing through them. But don't worry. There'll be more time to digest. So what we see here is this pattern I mentioned earlier. So on the um, kind of the y-axis, the long axis, are going to be these different anxiety measures, uh, total scores. And at the bottom are the time points. So time one is the beginning of the first year of the study. Time two is the end of the first year of the study. Time three is the beginning of the second year of the study. Time four is the end of the second year of the study. So what we see is all kids start the year higher in anxiety and come down a bit. Right? We see this consistent pattern. If you look at this one in particular, you see at the beginning of the next school year, they go back up. And then they come back down. Okay? Our kids who are in the green lines are the kids who are getting the anxiety intervention program. So they are showing slight benefits over the other kids. 
And you see that pretty universally across all three of these measures. Same idea where we look at these changes over time. So the percentage of kids who start low or high in anxiety now, um, and what they look like by group. So what we're seeing, and I'll focus on this one, is that the majority of kids start low, stay low. A smaller subset start high and stay high, our clinical kids. For our kids uh, who start high and then come down to low, we see a greater percentage of that occurring for kids who get the anxiety intervention, but not a huge amount difference. But again, where we see a bit of this difference is the kids who start low and develop anxiety over the course of the intervention period. We see much fewer kids who are in the anxiety group showing that pattern. Then because kids aren't blocked on anxiety at all, we wanted to pull out the subset of kids who actually were reporting high anxiety to begin with and take a look at them specifically to see if there were differences for those kids. And so we pulled out kids who were reporting elevated or clinical levels of anxiety from each of the groups, and we looked at their anxiety levels over the course of the study, the two years. And what we see, and the percentages you see here, are the percent who went from having elevated clinical levels at the beginning to not at the end. And what's remarkable here is that these percentages really parallel what we see with individualized treatment with CBT. So about two-thirds of the kids who are getting the anxiety treatment are responding. And about 40% of the kids who are getting an attention control, the reading and math, are responding. And much fewer, about 15%, the kids who are kind of our, more of our wait list type kids, are, are responding. Similarly, these are just showing the effect sizes, um, comparing the different groups for the kids who have elevated anxiety, and it's just a similar pattern. So we're just seeing medium, um, usually medium to large effects, favoring the reading and anxiety program for kids who began this, um, the study with high anxiety. Okay, so taking all of this in, <clears throat> The key findings we have here, um, we're finding students' anxiety may be reduced as part of this combined academic intervention targeting reading. This uh, initial decrease may reflect that struggling readers who are identified to receive any supports are actually benefiting, right, this nice drop we see. The continued downward trend we see suggests this added benefit for the anxiety intervention program. And that finding is, of course, bolstered by these last two slides I showed you where we actually pulled out kids who were highly anxious to begin with, that they're showing even uh, more pronounced effects. <clears throat> okay. And so the preliminary findings also reveal incremental benefits um, for the reading outcomes, but that's what you're going to be hearing more about this afternoon as well. So I'm going to stop here, but in your slides you'll see that I've also kind of provided some information about what can you do now for students in your schools who are um, experiencing stress, and then also kind of bad signs and good signs when you're evaluating programs that come in and claim to fix everything for the students in your schools. Um, just some different things to be on the lookout for when you're evaluating them and then some just additional resources here. All right, thank you. I have a ton of questions, but I'll limit it to like <laughs> two. Um, <laughs> How did you go about teasing out the difference between anxiety and ADHD? Um, and I ask this as a parent, um, because when I was first approached by my daughter's teacher, the claim was ADHD, but we know, we know she has dyslexia. So I was curious how you went about teasing that out. And then my second question is, have you thought about doing a partner program um, with parents? I know that um, UC Davis has a similar type thing going on with autism where they're doing coaching parents as well as teachers. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, first question. We did not tease out the effects of ADHD and anxiety. Um, so when I was talking about that, I was speaking more sort of just anecdotally from the, the work we do and have done in our clinics where we see exactly what you're describing. So where they, they look so similar that usually it's not until a child has a more comprehensive assessment that you actually figure out which, which it is. And sometimes it's both, right? They're highly comorbid with one another as well. And so that's a challenge. Um, what we were able to see is kind of separating out kids who were reporting high and low attention levels and what the experience of anxiety looked like when it was interacting with that for them. Um, your second question, that's already left my brain, is about... Um, teaching parents. Yes, teaching parents, thank you. <clears throat> yes. So I love this idea, and um, I, I think it is fantastic. We, um, in that second year where we have the kids bringing home the materials and continuing to work on things, ideally it is for them to be doing exactly that. But we also recognize that some of the kids in our um, studies don't have families at home that are able or willing to work with them in that way. Um, and we didn't want it to be kind of a, a punishing experience for kids, and that's why we made it broadened it back and said, you know, you can do this with your pet or your stuffed animal. And, but um, ideally, yes, getting parents involved and teaching them the same skills and keeping them on board with what the students are learning is, is the best approach, I would say. 